I guess it's good evening or good happy hour, everybody. So I'm quite impressed, even though I know for some it's required. I'm delighted to have people on at this time of the evening and hope you're relaxed somewhere. And um, uh, and not you, you may have children at your feet grabbing you, or maybe you just throw them their candy from last night. So... <laughs> But I'm delighted to be here. As, as Wendy said, I am the, um, and there's another, you can go one slide up, I guess. I am the um, CEO of the Oklahoma Center for Nonprofits. And just a little bit about my background. I came to this work, um, I'm, I'm in my 11th year, almost finishing my 11th year as, as the CEO at the center. But I came to this work from all my work in the community. Like many of you, I did Leadership Oklahoma City. I did Leadership Oklahoma. I served on a lot of nonprofit boards. Um, and that I just kind of became truly, I became a board governance junkie, really. I don't, it's a kind of an embarrassing thing to admit. Um, but um, I really got involved um, from that side and was doing some consulting and, and then asked to serve on the board of the center and my predecessor um, was tapped about a dozen years ago to head our United Way, like you have a female head of your United Way. And Allison, we have Debbie Hampton over here. So Debbie shifted over to the um, to be the CEO of our United Way of Central Oklahoma. And I was a board member of the center and was um, um, asked to consider the position. And here I am. So I'm delighted. I live and breathe everything nonprofit sector. And I know by a time I'd love to get an introduction of each of you and know what you're, where you are and who you are and why you're, you know, are excited to be, I'm sure, in, involved in Leadership Tulsa, but also um, your interest in the nonprofit sector, but it doesn't allow for that much time. So at the end, you will see my contact information and I'm uh, readily available and love to talk and answer any questions you might have. So that's just a little bit about me and um, and the sector. I do want to mention, though, that besides that, I do serve, as Wendy said, uh, at the national level. I am the um, current board chair and will be, it's a two-year stint to be the board chair of the National Council for Nonprofits. So the center, um, if you aren't familiar with, is, is really like the Chamber of Commerce or the association of all the nonprofits in the state of Oklahoma. And about 45 other states have such an entity. Many of them are called like the Louisiana Association of Nonprofits or the Pennsylvania Association of Nonprofits. Four Acre, in Alaska, it's called Four Acre because they named it after a mountain. So you can name it whatever you want. But basically, we are membership organizations of nonprofits within our state, within our states. And then we uh, then convene at the national level through the National Council of Nonprofits, which uh, does a ton of advocacy work for our sector at the federal level and hooks and networks us all together. So, so that's me. And um, I really love Q&A. And Wendy, we didn't really talk about that. Do people put stuff in the chat or what, what do you like on these? Or is it yeah, so sometimes I actually interrupt you and do a little chit chat. Um, people are welcome to put something in the chat when I'm actually sharing my screen. Sometimes I don't see it immediately, uh, but then certainly any time we have at the end, we can do Q&A. Okay, perfect. Because I really want to meet your needs and, and have you ask me what you would ask me about. So, um, but I will, I will forge through and just obviously, um, you know, we have a lot of nonprofits in Oklahoma, and we'll, um, we'll see some of the numbers about those um, here in a minute. But you know what, we always laugh, there's a nonprofit for that. I mean, there is a nonprofit for everything. And just when I think I've heard about every possible mission in the whole world, we'll get a call at the center for somebody who wants to do something. And I get asked a lot, like, can't you kind of slow them down? Can't you kind of merge them? Can't you kind of make... And, you know, that's not really what I'm in the business to do. I'm there to support the missions of every nonprofit in Oklahoma, wherever they are. And certainly if someone calls the center and says, hey, I have this great idea and I want to start this and so nonprofit, um, the first thing I ask them is, are you ready to really open a business? I mean, do you understand what you're talking about? You have to have a board. You have to have financial statements. You have to you know, register with that stay, you have to, you know, do a 990. And, you know, so I explained that. And then the other thing we really do is say, hey, that sounds like a great idea, but why don't you call, you know, NSO, Neighborhood Services, because they do some things like that. And maybe you could, you know, um, talk to Stacy and you could talk about your idea. So again, I, you know, if someone comes to us and wants to merge or acquire, we can certainly work with them. But in, in, in reality, we're really here to support all these great missions. And um, you know, I, I think of some of the names of nonprofits and, and um, 
and you know, I think of El Sistema here. It's a, a it's a youth orchestra here in Oklahoma City. You know, it's not even that old. And if someone had, had said, "Oh, don't don't form," because there's already a youth orchestra, they they meet a different population. So sometimes it's some of the newer ones are really the ones that are meeting the need exactly where it is at the moment. So, so as you say, we have a nonprofit for everything in Oklahoma. So next slide. So let's um, let's talk about you know why we need nonprofits in Oklahoma, and we are really if you can just clip through these, they'll pop on Wendy. But really, Oklahoma, as you know, is a very very high need state, and while we're no longer first in overall incarceration in Oklahoma, we're still first in female incarceration. We have you know a very high uh, level or population of people who live in poverty, a very high level of people who live with disabilities, and a very long list of for weight, for services, for disabilities, our health outcomes are bad, our education outcomes are bad. So we really, you know, we could spend an hour, all of us opening up and just talking about why we think it's like this, but it is like this. And, you know, we are a low tax state and, um, you know, we, we have, we, we, you know, we have a, um, and we, and, and we, and we tend to want to stay that way. And so even though we do get, um, we have good partnerships, many nonprofits, and you'll see with our our state government through grants and opportunities, we still have a whole lot to work on in Oklahoma. And I think COVID is really showing, and we'll talk about some of that as well, that we were, we were the go-to place for the people in need during COVID. So, so they, we are, we have a lot of them, but they need us. So uh, I maybe have some lawyers on here, but obviously let's first of all talk about, just keep clicking, Wendy, uh, uh, the, you know, what's the difference between a nonprofit and a for-profit? So obviously, you all understand that a, you know, a, if you have a publicly held company by law, you have to maximize shareholder investment and create profit for the owners or shareholders. So if you're a for-profit corporation, that's what you do. And truthfully, even if you're not, um, you know, you know um, even if you're just a privately held business, you're out there really to make money for yourself. And then, but a nonprofit goal is, you know, the goal is really, it isn't about shareholder uh, profit maximization. It's really to ensure the public good by working on whatever mission your organization is working on. So it's, they're very, very different ki types of things. Now, one, the one thing that all nonprofits have in common is a tax status. And we laugh about that. Um, you know, other than that, and, and some of the rules around transparency, the things that nonprofits have to do. Uh, nonprofits really share a tax status, but they have so many missions as we've already talked about. So there, uh, um, I think if you hit this one more time, Wendy, it's going to talk about a new kind of corporation that um, we worked on this legislation. We didn't, we didn't author this legislation, but about two years ago, and it, maybe it's three now because of my COVID brain, um, benefit corporations or B Corps were formed in Oklahoma. So they really are, they are kind of a hybrid. They are not a nonprofit. You can't give a donation to a B Corp and get a tax write off, but they do have an opportunity to be motivated by something other than profits. And say they were very common in other states and Oklahoma did not have them. So a couple of years ago, um, um, there was an effort to get those into law and they do exist. So you can, you can have an incorporated business now in Oklahoma that isn't solely run on a, um, a desire to maximize shareholder investment. It also can have a, a kind of what we would almost call a philanthropic purpose to it as well. So the nonprofit world is huge. So these are the new numbers or the most recent numbers about how big it is in the United States. So you can see, you know, 1.5 million uh, nonprofit exempt organizations. Sometimes we're called EOs, exempt organizations in the country. And you can see um, there's all kinds of ways, shapes, and forms. You know, there's there's charities, which is what most people think of. But what you have to know, 501c3s, private foundations are also 501c3s, and there's over 100,000 private foundations in the country. Then there's all kinds of other, uh, you know, not chambers of commerce, civics leagues, membership organizations, and then um, congregations. So there are, as we know in Oklahoma, we have a lot of churches, and there are a lot of churches nationwide. So again, tons of assets, I mean, trillions of assets and trillions of resources in, in, um, in our sector. And we are the third largest um, employment sector in the United States. And we, we employ almost 10% of the workforce in the United States. So we are a very large employment sector in the country. And as you see, the, you know, as, 
you know, we always, if, if any of you are with organizations that use volunteers, you, you know, you take how many volunteers and multiply it by that. I don't even know what the current number is for a volunteer hour. It's like $26 an hour. And we have billions of dollars worth of volunteer um, service hours that are given to our sector every, every year in the country. I'm actually surprised there's not more than 312,000 congregations. It seems like there's 312,000 congregations in Oklahoma. <laughs> Yeah, my guess is on that, Wendy, is that like, you know, Methodists would be one. You know, I see, United that Methodist makes sense. One. And then, you know, <laughs> Baptist would be one and Southern Baptist would be another. So, yeah. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, I think, yeah, there's, I, feel, I agree. Well, yeah, there's probably more churches than gas stations. So, <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about Oklahoma um, in the next slide and how big, um, how big we are. And we do update this with uh, IRS data every year. But um, so as of last December, and we'll update these again at the end of this year, there's over 20,000 tax exempt organizations in the state of Oklahoma. So uh, next to that, you can see the breakdown. So um, how many are public charities? And as you can see, 11,000 public charities, but we have excluded churches and private foundations. And then you see there's all 12, over 1,200 private foundations in Oklahoma. Then there's other nonprofits, the chambers and so on, and 3,659 churches. Now churches have a special, and some of you may be pastors, I don't know, but you know, you can't just declare I'm the church of Marnie Taylor and become a, a, you know, a nonprofit church. You have to prove that you have service, you know, um, you have ongoing services and those kinds of things. So the IRS is pretty, they're careful about the, you know, the separation of church and state, but they're also, you know, you can't just declare you're a church and be a church. So I think um, that's really important. Um, and as you know, I, I'll probably mention a couple of times during this, Senator Langford, um, who came from a church nonprofit background, has been really instrumental in a lot of the legislation in Washington, D.C. that's been helpful to the nonprofit sector. And, you know, every time I have a conversation with him and I'm privileged to have a lot of, com oops, I just lost you. Sorry. There we are. I have a lot of conversations with him. You know, he, he'll say, Faith-based organizations and church, I mean, faith-based organizations and nonprofits. He, he always separates them in his language, but they are both all 501c3s. So then you can see the uh, lower left corner talks about how big we are, you know, how much, um, how much uh, we have in, in, we have billions in revenue and, and billions in assets. Um, you know, there are, I will tell you this, this is kind of any, there are 20,000 nonprofits in Oklahoma, but only 4,044 of them actually report revenue on their 990. And I think that's a very interesting fact and one that is very surprising to people. So a lot of people, um, and remember several years ago, if you didn't fill out a 990 after three or four years, they actually took, took your tax status away. And so they're very careful make, to make sure at the, at the IRS that people are filling out their 990s and there's shorter forms and easy forms and things like that for organizations. But obviously a lot of people are filling out an um, easy form saying they have no um, revenue in any given year. So those could be episodic things. Those could be shells that they never, they just don't want to have to reapply for their nonprofit status. So once they got it, they want to keep it. They keep filling out their postcard, but they are really not up and running entities um, because they don't have any revenue. Now they could be all volunteer organizations as well. So remember that they, um, and there isn't really a way to garner that information from the IRS data. Um, so if you look the way, go back one more, Wendy, sorry, I want to go to that. Um, so there, um, uh, this is Oklahoma County. My apologies. We didn't catch that, but I, oh, Tulsa County is very similar in the number of nonprofits registered in Tulsa County, as well as how many have a budget. Um, so there are around 4,000 nonprofits in Tulsa and about 1,200 uh, off the top of my head, if I remember, actually have a budget. So that's how big your sector is in Tulsa. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I missed that one. Now, this is one of my favorite slides. Um, and this comes from the National Council, but it really shows uh, where revenue comes from in, in the sector. Now, think about this. This is an average nonprofit dollar, and there really is no such thing, but they take all the money that goes into the sector and come up with what this dollar looks like. So every single nonprofit's dollar would look different. For example, at the Center for Nonprofits, which is a nonprofit, 
we don't have any government grants or contracts. So my dollar wouldn't have that 31%, 31.8% of grants and contracts. I would be more heavily skewed to pri uh, private foundations and individual donations. But if you really wanna get a scope of what we're dealing with, when you think about us as an employer, as an economic driver, as how we are, how are we are sustained as a sector, Almost 50% of money across the country comes into nonprofits through fees for service. And if I could talk to you all or see you all, I would ask you if you knew why, but think about uh, nonprofit hospitals. So St. Francis is a nonprofit hospital. So think about how many fees for service they get. Think about uh, University of Tulsa, think about Oklahoma City University. So all those, um, all those private universities and private hospital, in, in the world of nonprofits, we call them eds and meds. So eds and meds really make, you know, create, a, create a lot about this dollar. You know, Harvard and all the pri huge private schools around the country, think about their tuition. So almost 50% of money that goes into our sector is earned. Then almost 32% is earned through government contracts or grants. So a lot, we are very, very, very in, intertwined and in partnership with government. And I think that we saw that a lot during um, COVID and, and are going to continue to see it during the um, ARPA funding. So then the next one, I, this is where people get a little bit surprised. You know, then there are individuals um, and then private foundations, bequests, corporations and other, and other could be interest income or you know endowment income or those kinds of things. So when you really think about it, you can take like 81% of money, or yeah, 81% of money that goes into nonprofits doesn't come from donations, which is kind of an interesting thing. But again, any, you know, Wendy, you could draw your dollar for Leadership Tulsa and you would know what it looked like. Yeah, it's probably about 50% earned income, no government contracts, and about 50% contributed income at this point. And what I would say to anyone is that the if you have a really reliable, sustainable source of earned income, it makes your organization much more sustainable and scalable. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's where I think we're seeing a lot of ingenuity and creativity from our sector, uh, whether it's, you know, um, women in recovery selling their cookies or, you know, all the different things. There's so many, so many, many um, uh, ways that for, for us to be creative. So let's go, let's talk about the philanthropic dollars. So, uh, um, yeah, this is those fancy things. Um, so the philanthropic dollars, many of you've probably seen this. I know Wendy probably has, but for those of us in, in the world of fundraising, this is a, probably the most important study that comes out every year. And so these are the 2019 numbers. It's called Giving USA. And pretty soon, yeah, you know, the next one will be the 2020 numbers. There's certainly a lag in, in the information. But consistently, don't worry too much about the graph on the left. It's a little more complicated than we need to talk about. But first of all, look, $449 billion was given in 2019. So if you think about that, there's 365 days in the year, it's more than a billion dollars a day is being donated to the nonprofit sector. So I think that's really amazing. And then you look at the, at the uh, pie chart, you know, almost 70% of that is from people, from individual people. So, um, you know, I think if you serve on a board and you're thinking, oh, we gotta go after this grant and we have to go after grant grant, I'm not gonna say don't, but just know there are a lot of nonprofits that are very sustained through individual gifts and, and never forget about bequests at 10% of revenue. You know, planned giving um, is, a, is a hot topic. I know Tulsa has a lot of good effort put by, uh, into many organizations around planned gifts. And we certainly encourage that as well. So again, Nash, you know, if, if you took, if Wendy took her philanthropic donations and I took mine, ours would look different. You know, I am heavier on corporations and foundations. Um, but when you see the next chart, if we go to that, you're going to see why. Because remember those churches? Well, guess what? So all those individuals are giving a lot of money to churches and to education. 
So, you know, if you ask people um, where they give their money, um, you know, especially in Oklahoma, you know, um, their religious affiliation and then their educational institution, their kids' school, whatever, um, you know, always end up at number one and number two. And then after that, you know, um, um, sorry, that shouldn't say human resources, that should say human services, human services are next. So all the, you know, the United Way agencies, all the, and there's many great human service organizations that are not affiliated with United Ways, but those are what you kind of think of. And then, you know, arts and culture, as you can see, is um, significant. I think if we did this for Oklahoma City or Tulsa, we'd probably even see a greater amount um, in, um, in arts and culture, because we both, both towns, both cities have really strong um, arts, arts organizations and, and thrive off of them. So that's, again, national studies about giving. So let's see what happened to giving during COVID. So Giving Tuesday is not only is it a day, it's an organization. <laughs> so I, everybody probably knows that Giving Tuesday is the day after th the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. And um, good story about that, how that came to be, but it came to be and it's been very successful. But they started doing some research about giving as well. And I think that this is interesting. This is year over year data. So anything that's uh, that's below the zero uh, mark means that the, the um, that the giving dipped. And this was only um, through, through 2020, as you can see, but it's a pretty good look. And, and everything that I've read um, across the country really about what happened to giving during the pandemic, this really proves it out. As you can see, these colored lines are all the sizes of gifts. So that top purple or bluish purple line is gifts of over $50,000 or more. And then the turquoise is a dollar to a hundred dollars. So you can see um, the trends, the people, you know, originally the large gifts at the beginning of January of 20 were um, up 15% year over year. Then as the pandemic came, they dipped a bit. They never went below the year over year, but they dipped a bit. Then they went back up and then they, and then they kind of evened out. So the, the, you know, everything that has been really documented and, and some of it's, you know, they're now being able to get enough facts around it, but is that large nonprofits who had large donors seem to withstand the pandemic very, very well. And this graph plays that out. If you are a smaller organization, look at that little poor little green line down there, which are gifts between $500 and $5,000, which might be, you know, where some of us are in our giving. Um, you know, it, it was, it started the year, you know, um, above 5% above where it was the year before. And then look what happened. So these are people who didn't know whether they were still going to have their jobs. Um, you know, and um, some of these people, you know, used to give, and now they were receivers of, um, of um, services rather than donors to the organizations that were giving. So I think this is a really interesting graph to see. And I'm, my guess is that they'll you know, do this again at the end of, um, of 21 and show us what happened. But um, you know, a, lot of, you know, a lot of smaller organizations, unless they were directly you know, in line to help victims of COVID or, or, or you know, essential services that people just came to the rally um, and were depending on smaller donors um, did have a hard time. You know, I have a great example with the very largest donors. We had a couple of grants that were um, supposed to be looked at in March of 2020. They got put on hold because nobody knew exactly what was going to happen. But the foundations picked them back up in June and we ultimately got the grants uh, that we had been hoping for. And um, so I, that kind of plays out this story that people contracted immediately trying to figure out what was happening and then went ahead. Um, we also have a question from Adrian. How are large donations tied to the overall financial markets, endowment surplus over expectation? So as the, um, I guess, as the stock market rises and falls, do you know how that impacts large donations? Yes. I, I mean, I, that's a great question. And I think some of the skitty, skittishness about the market is reflected in these early dips as well from the very wealthy people who are probably, you know, people give out, give two ways. They give out of their, uh, their uh, out of their cash flow, 
like you write the check, you put it on your credit card or whatever, you get it out of your cash flow. So it's instead of buying this, you're buying, you're donating to that, or they give out of their wealth. And, you know, wealthier people tend to give out of their wealth. They make stock gifts or gifts out of their IRA. So as they were watching the stock market, um, a, they, a, their corpuses of, of some of their, um, if they had private foundations or donor advised funds where things were invested might be going down or just they were going to give stock gifts out of their regular own personal accounts. Um, so that, I think that reflects that a lot. I mean, I, you know, I think we're all scared to death. Whoever imagined the market was going to do what it's doing. Um, so I think there's going to be, you know, I will in a few years retire and I will sit home and just study what happened during, <laughs> during the whole thing when it's said and done. But go to the next slide. I think this is very interesting. This is about organizations that stopped fundraising in 2020. And this is really fascinating. I mean, look at that. In 2019, organizations that were, you know, uh, were not fundraising um, you know, really kind of stayed steady. But in 2020, it went up. And interestingly enough, I talked to some foundations that said, we're just shocked. I mean, early in COVID, they're like, we're not getting, we got far less requests, um, grant requests during this cycle is, you know, most of them have cycles, like it's, you know, grants are due on a certain day. They'd say, we're just shocked. We're getting less. And I, I haven't had a lot of time to study or read about why that might have happened. Um, some of it is, you know, we were all shell shocked. We didn't even know where our staff was, were they coming or going? Could they still work for us? Were their kids out of school? You know, all of that. D did we have the capacity? I do think a little of this could be in Oklahoma. This would probably be reflected in the fact that some of us couldn't have our non our uh, events. So, you know, we weren't raising money for the event because we weren't happy the event. So, um, so I think that, I, I mean, that, that's dramatic line, but it's a small percent, but I think it just speaks to the fact that most people would think you double down rather than stop, but people did slow down. And again, I think it was probably a human capital um, situation. So, okay, next slide. Um, so this is some data that some of it's our survey data and some of it's um, other data we've gotten, but the bottom line about PPP loans is in. So 3,846 nonprofits received PPP loans, hopefully some of the ones that you all might be affiliated with for almost a half a billion dollars. So, you know, that's like a, just my mouth drops when I talk about that, because think about if a, almost a half a billion dollars had not come into our sector through those loans, where we would be. There, there are not, we have great philanthropists, but they couldn't have come up just with all that money. You know, um, it, it was a significant shift. You know, nonprofits had not been included in SBA loans prior to PPP loans. And I will say you have, you know, the National Council for Nonprofits and the groups, the you know, National United Way and all of those strong national affiliates worked their hardest, as did our own Senator Langford, because of his you know, interest and in, in passion for our uh, nonprofits to get us included, because we could have easily been cut from the bill and um, not um, been allowed to apply for PPP loans. So those were a lifesaver. Um, because just, you know, 56% said they got lower grant money in Oklahoma, 43%. These are our, from our surveys, 43% had low, lower confidence in their res revenue. Um, and then nationally, initially, nonprofit job loss was big. John Hop Johns Hopkins did a study on this, and they're, they did it monthly in the beginning. They've kind of slowed down. We're getting about every three months. But more than a million jobs were lost in our sector uh, about half of those have been recovered, but I would say that really probably, you know, a half of the million that were originally lost were lost in, in the arts. Um, not to be surprised because as you know, performance is just shut down and people just laid off their, I mean, you know, some arts organizations kept a creative director and executive director and everybody else lost their job. So the arts just took a beating and the artists therefore took a beating. So we have the numbers are back. We're, we're, we're just shy of, uh, of 500,000 job, jobs lost currently. 
Um, but and arts are coming back at a faster pace, but they're still still one of the biggest losers, unfortunately. So let's talk about, um, this is, okay, Candid is another national organization that measures giving, and they too decided to do a survey, but I thought this was interesting, um, it, what happened nationally uh, in philanthropy's, philanthropy's response to COVID. So you can see in January, since January of 2020, and this came out, I think at the end of last year, there were 32,500 grants um, given um, by private foundations and the total of the grants was 13.3 billion and the numbers and so on. But if you think about that, that's a lot of money. But if you go back to the last slide and you think the whole value of those grants was 13.3 billion, and think about, I don't, you know what I don't have in this presentation, I need to find out what was the total amount of PPP uh, across the country. But in Oklahoma alone, it was half a billion dollars. So, so philanthropy stepped up in a huge way. We can all be very grateful. And, and some of you may be involved with those organizations or philanthropists yourself. But when you think about it, the fact that we did have that assistance from the government, um, it really did save our sector. So. Okay, so let's talk about what else happened. Again, this is our, our from our survey data. 22% um, of nonprofits in Oklahoma City said they eliminated at least one position. Um, you know, so it was a le lesser job loss than it was across the country, but still a job loss. 58% saw they had an increase in demand for services. Um, think about all the people who needed help, mental health, help with children, help with feeding their families. 64% um, said they um, has had a negative impact on their ability to respond to the increased demand. So they, they have an increased demand and they can't meet it. Also still low confidence in fundraising, meeting goals. And I think for us who pay to play in Oklahoma City and Tulsa with all of our galas and fun parties and picnics and auctions, 83% of Oklahoma nonprofits said they were negatively impacted um, with their fundraising events. So, you know, shifting to Zoom, shifting to hybrid, Zoom was cute and fun for a while and they delivered a meal and it could follow wide to your door and that was fun once. And after that, we're like, mm, I don't know if I'm really gonna do that thousand dollar sponsorship again, you know, until they go back live. So that's what we heard a lot. You know, the center did, we hope we listened a lot and shared a lot of information, but this is something we heard um, and did a lot of um, help calls on and, and calls for the sector to um, during it because they were struggling with events. So, so I'm going to shift now into um, ARPA, um, American Rescue Plan Act. If I, most of you probably heard the acronym by now, I, I I think I have it branded in my brain, so I say it in my sleep. ARPA, 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 but. I'm gonna kind of fill you in on where we are in Oklahoma right now with ARPA. And, um, and, uh, and then I'll, I'm gonna give you a few things about what's going on nationally. But you know, most of you know the reason for ARPA, the basics and why we need it um, and what it can be used for. And that's, that's very strict, just like with the CARES money, you know, we could, any organization that receives ARPA funds, you know, will be, a, could, can get audited, probably will get audited. We'll see, they may do a safe harbor uh, amount like they did with PPP, but it's, you know, it can't just be used for anything. So in Oklahoma, we got $3.2 billion almost, next slide, um, in total ARPA funding, but what I want to tell you, this is what is, um, this does not include what the tribes got, which is a whole lot. This does not include also what went directly to like the Department of Agriculture or the Department of Education or certain DHS programs. So this is really just the money that is now up for grabs um, through the government entities. So of that 3.19, uh, 1.87 is in the legislative committee allocation. And uh, you probably heard some about this. Um, you know, I started hearing about it in um, midsummer and the committee started being formed in meetings. So, so there is a legislative committee. Then there are um, what are called NEUs and those are non-entitlement units. Th that 237 million is going to organize, or excuse me, cities or towns that have a population of less than 50,000. 
And then uh, the counties are getting a lot of money, as you can see. I'm sure you've heard some about the Tulsa County money. And then the 10 largest metro areas are getting 300 million. So Oklahoma City is getting their own money. Tulsa is getting their own money. And then the other eight other larger uh, cities are getting their own money. And I will just tell you, there is no who's doing it the same, you know, and uh, they all had some CARES money. They probably learned some lessons, did it one way, maybe you're replicating some of what they're doing in Oklahoma County. We have a huge jail problem. And the rumor is our money's all going to go to the jail, but who knows? So, um, um, so that's the way the money is being distributed. Some of the Oklahoma City has kind of already told the, the city council how they would like to distribute their money but the state money still has um, a lot of opportunities. So I thought I'd share that with you. And some of you may be ARPA experts. Um, I, uh, so, uh, or you may have a lot of questions, I don't know. And this is gonna be, if you wanna go to the next slide, kind of a, a high, um, high overview. So first of all, this looks way more like an appropriations process than anything else. And if, if you're familiar with that, it's, you know, it's legislators determining what the, where the money's gonna go. The only thing about this is there's no past budget to work from because when, you, when they go at the end of the legislative session to appropriate, they kind of always, you know, they know what buckets it goes in. There's no roadmap on this money. So they hired, um, these are the committee members, um, Roger Thompson, who's head of appropriations in the Senate and uh, Representative Kevin Wallace, who's head of appropriations in the House are the co-chairs of this committee. Um, and these are the members of the committee. Um, the um, hired um, a liaison, Melissa Houston, um, who at one point was our labor commissioner. I think you might know her name from um, that. She now has her own consulting company. Melissa is um, doing oversight and helping them work this process. And then they have hired a company, I don't think it's in the slides, called Guidehouse. So if you hear about Guidehouse, it is a um, subsidiary of Price Waterhouse. And they have, they're hired out around the country to help um, states or municipalities or whoever wants to hire them, I guess, to work with um, their government entities in order to make sure they're appropriating and spreading this money out fo to follow the rules. Basically, they're, if you think about Price Auto Waterhouse, which was not a firm, they're really people who tell you how to you know, not get in trouble. So, so, um, so if you hear about Guidehouse, that's who Guidehouse is. And they, uh, they got hired, um, well, they tried to hire them in the summer, it took a while. So the portal for applications is, you know, was gonna open August and it was gonna open in September and it finally opened October 1st. But these are the decision makers. So if you are looking for ARPA money, these are the people that you most want to influence um, because they will be making the decisions. So next slide. Um, there, as we've already said, $1.87 do billion dollars will be um, distributed by that group of people. Um, it must be allocated by December 31st of 24, and it must be used up by December um, 31st of 26. So there are a lot of rules about what you can and cannot do with the money. You cannot, you know, you um, cannot pay back debt with the money. So if your organization's in debt, uh, don't apply for that. Um, and um, but that, that's the time frame of it. And the funding is coming in two waves uh, and that happened at the city and county level as well, 50% um, at the time of application and then another 50% will be coming after that. So if you, know, you might get your, if you apply and they like what you wanna do with it, you might get all your money at once or they might give you half and half. Um, okay, so here's the process. There is a portal, it opened on October, oops, oops. Um, it opened on October 1st, if we can go back to that. I don't know if any of you have been on it. We got on it the first day. Oh, that doesn't want to stay. Um, yeah, I swear I'm not hitting the button. It just no, really I know, we had trouble with one of our other slides. But anyway, I can talk <laughs> you through. But I, I know this by heart. But um, it, it, um, there's a portal, and I don't know if any of you put it, have put proposals in. And it will then go, actually Guidehouse will look at it with Melissa's group and decide whether it's eligible. And if it is, it'll be assigned to a subcommittee. And the subcommittees then will have conversations about, um, about what, what they want and what they've seen. The subcommittees have all met already. They've kind of heard about all the different opportunities that are out there. 
Um, I, I have slides galore on who's on the committees and what they do, but just in general, it will be, it, it'll be assigned to a subcommittee. After the subcommittee agrees that it's something they'd like to do, then it goes back to the full committee. After the full committee re-agrees, it goes to a scoring committee. And on that scoring committee, you will have members of the governor's staff and so on. And so in the end, I will say that if you know the governor's office has to sign off on everything. He's given a lot of power and control um, to the, the subcommittee, and, I mean, to the big committee, and then which is called the joint committee and, and um, Wallace and Thompson. But in the end, um, you know, he will certainly have a say and his staff will have a say. So uh, because in the end, the, you know, the state of Oklahoma is liable for the money. So that's really how it works. So just a little bit about engaging in policy and, and, and lobbying. I, I think that I, if I haven't convinced you enough that if we hadn't lobbied for PPP loans, we'd be at almost a half a billion dollars in this state. So really important. So I do know that nonprofits can lobby. I hope you all know that. I think Lauren's gonna talk about it. It can be education, it can be advocacy, or it can really be lobbying you know, specifically for a bill and also, um, even though I've mentioned someone, a senator's name on this, I'm not endorsing him. I'm just telling you about his involvement with this sector. But you know, nonprofits cannot endorse political candidates, and I would just Lauren will talk more about that when she presents. But as we are entering campaign season, and we are there, it's a year away, um, and everybody's declaring, and you know, sides are being taken that nonprofits have to be very, very, very careful about never endorsing or showing favoritism or un, you know, unequal opportunity for someone, people who would be running for an office. So um, I think that's really important. But you know, this is our favorite quote, and many of you know Dan Billingsley who worked with me, but he, this, he made this slide years ago. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And then we had a wonderful employee here who was a seasoned woman who said, however, for the next slide, she said, this was what Shirley Chisholm said, if you don't, if they don't give you a seat at the table, you can always bring your folding chair. So um, I think um, there are many people, <laughs> not just nonprofits, there's populations of people, there's genders of people, there's all kinds of people who've had to bring a folding chair. And um, you know, what we do at the center is really encourage nonprofits to, um, to, bring, a, you know, to bring their chair to the table. Fortunately, uh, when Governor Stick came in um, and he appointed um, Sean Copeland, a great Tulsa guy, to be a Secretary of um, Commerce, um, Sean Copeland did put a table together, and that table was an advisory committee to the Department of Commerce. And for the first time in the history of Oklahoma, the nonprofit sector was invited to the table. So I was one of 10 advisors to the Department of Commerce under Secretary Copeland for two years. And from that, we have actually engaged a nonprofit council that doesn't report to the center, it reports up through commerce. And it meets quarterly just to keep the whole sector connected. Because as you saw earlier, we're huge employers, we're huge economic drivers. So not only does you know, Justin Brown at DHS wanna know what we're doing and all health department wanna know what we're doing, the Department of Commerce really um, you know, engages us and cares about us as a business sector. So um, I think there's another slide. Um, I, I got back in town Sunday, so I, I apologize. A couple of these slides I didn't have it, um, a couple to make a couple of tweaks on. But you know, here's here's really uh, you all who are, are leaders in Tulsa. Many of you very seasoned leaders in Tulsa, but obviously you know that way. There's so many ways to get involved. You know, from volunteering to donating, which you've heard about serving on boards of directors, which you all are getting prepared to do and being trained to do, but also just know that advocating, you know, even if you're not on the board of an organization, but you really believe in what they're doing and you hear that there's a bill in the legislature or at the federal level about what that organization is, it is so impactful when a volunteer or a board member or an advisory board member um, calls a legislator, meets with them to advocate on behalf of a mission. It just, it is, it is huge. And Lauren will speak more to that, but it's interesting how few phone calls they often get on some issues. And just a phone call or an email from um, someone, and especially a constituent, can really, really make a difference. So, um, you know, the Center for Nonprofits is here. We, you know, we assist in all things nonprofit. Um, and, and then some, we became, you know, experts in PPP loans. We're becoming experts in ARPA. 
Um, and um, so that's what we're, hopefully you all know that we are a resource to any of your nonprofits. And then the next one is really just a little bit about of our history. We're celebrating 40 years, our Visions event, which will be um, on Giving Tuesday. We always have our Visions event. We have our one event in Tulsa and our Visions event in Oklahoma City, but they're both statewide. But we will be also be celebrating our 40th anniversary uh, this year. And if you ever wonder about the power of one woman, Pat Potts had an awful lot, of, an awful good idea 40 years ago because we have an incredibly, incredibly strong nonprofit sector in Oklahoma. And I give a lot of credit to Pat Potts for realizing 40 years ago that nonprofits were businesses and they needed to look at things as businesses and have transparency and have good practices. And, you know, she then came up with the vision of the Oklahoma Center for Nonprofits. So, um, and then I think the last one is my contact information. Um, and well, I didn't do slides on what's going on in Washington because I left a week ago and they would have been moot points had I made them. But obviously, you know, I was up there with the state chamber. Some of you might've been up there. Maybe you were up with the Tulsa chamber was up there when the state chamber was up there. Um, right now, all the issues that every, everybody's dealing with it, you know, the Build Back Better program, the reconciliation bills, all of that, many of those things um, are, will affect nonprofits in some ways. So we're um, awaiting, awaiting how all of those pass things like, you know, uh, universal pre-K and child tax credits, of course, affect a lot of the clients of our nonprofits. So um, you know, most nonprofits, again, need to be paying attention to both the uh, federal and state legislation. As a rule, COVID has been an uh, unusual time for the impact that national legislation has on the everyday nonprofit. I will say that most of the activity that's going to affect a nonprofit um, has to do with what's going on at their municipal level, their county level or their state level. So, um, but generally, the big concerns right now are workforce, just like the workforce um, is such an issue for, you know, um, restaurants, retailers, you know, truck drivers, cargo people, all of that's affecting everyone. And, and the nonprofit sector is not immune to that. So at the National Council, one of the things we're talking about more than anything is just um, keep retaining our people. And, um, and uh, you know, now that maybe we, our financial situations feel a little more stable, um, and hopefully ARPA will add to some of that stability for our organizations that keeping um, good people employed. You know, we've always probably had lower pay scales in many of our for-profit businesses. Um, but I also know as all of you or any of you who work in the sector know that we wouldn't take any other jobs. So we, we love working in this sector and feel good about it every day. So with that, Wendy, I think we're we have a few minutes if anybody yeah. has any questions. So while people are thinking if they have any questions, um, one comment, I actually think our pay scales are improving in the nonprofit yes. sector. And um, my question to you, and as we wait and see if anyone online has any question, is if you could snap your fingers and make one great thing happen for nonprofits, what would you do? Oh, that's a really good question. You should have given it to me, although you went earlier ago. Ahead of time. Well, let me tell you what one of mine while yeah, you're thinking. Good. So um, I would love Oklahoma to get consistent on sales tax exemption across all nonprofits Excellent. because it's very complicated. Yes, and not every nonprofit is sales tax. Exactly. And I will, I'll give you a little background information on that. So yeah. in many states, it is consistent. You know, there is a state law. In Oklahoma, it is not. There are some that are in the statutes that are by statute and everybody else, you have to go out there and hire a lobbyist or get it passed just mm -hmm. for your individual organization, which is so unfair, mm -hmm. so unfair. And I will preface this by saying my husband is a lobbyist who makes money out of doing that kind of work. And that is so unfair. He agrees it's unfair. And, you know, I will say I've also had a conversation with Senator Thompson, who is a very powerful person who agrees with us, Wendy, on that, mm -hmm. but said it would just be a hard, um, you know, pill to swallow. The municipalities would fight us. That's a good point. You know, that's, they're that's, so sales tax dependent. Yep. It's a that's great right. point. That's who would fight us. More than the state would fight us, the municipalities would fight us because oh. it would be into their tax base. I'll give you another one that's a little bit, it's not my only magical one, but something else we're looking at right now is Open Meetings Act. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, there are many nonprofit attorneys who would say Open Meetings Act shouldn't apply to anything except government entities. It really shouldn't apply to nonprofit organizations, even if they get um, 
um, government contracts, that the law is being um, um, interpreted incorrectly. And so that's whole, that's one whole thing that should it even be true or should it be just in the meeting where you're deciding where those monies are going to go, that that meeting has to be open and the rest of your meetings can be closed because it, it can be argued too that oftentimes you are less transparent because you're unwilling to bring up things. You might have an HR issue, you might have other things and you're unwilling to bring them up really what needs to be talked about doesn't get talked about because you're now in an open setting. So, and the other problem we had with them, a huge problem we had with them is many of your corporations who many of you might work for didn't allow their people to go to meetings. And so once the, you know, they put a temporary stop in there where open meetings could be on Zoom and actually even the press loved it because they could be in more places at more times, yeah. they had more accessibility, they didn't have to go places. Mm -hmm. But uh, when that ended, it ended a about two months earlier than it should have before the legislature was going to go back in se session and could switch it. We had boards unable to make quorum. Yeah. They couldn't make quorum because their corporate employees weren't allowed to show up in person. Mm -hmm. So where the center is uh, looking at um, trying to correct that um, uh, this time. But, you know, one of the things that would, for me, just be a magic wand is that everyone really understood about the power of advocacy and the power of being in relationship with their legislature and, um, and would um, really take advantage of it, embrace it and get trained in it and not be afraid of it. And because um, it's so, so important because with the strike of a pin, okay, I'll tell you a real funny story. Uh, at our Visions Awards, our Curbside Chronicle, which is our homeless newspaper, is getting one of our, uh, our honors this year. They're just an amazing couple that started our newspaper. But they also have a flower shop and, and they also sell snow cones. Well, when I met with them to surprise them with the fact they were getting our Visions Awards, they said, actually, we're on our way to the Capitol. There's actually a law in Oklahoma that says you can only sell snow cones six months out of the year. Now, who would have thought, why would anyone have a law that says you can only sell snow cones six months out of the year? But they wanted to sell snow cones all year. So they were going to have to go lobby some stupid law in Oklahoma. So I think it's just, it was a great example for me that, you know, you never know when a stroke of a pen can put you in business or take you out of business. So that's crazy. Yeah. And that's a great um, uh, advertisement too for our December 6th program on advocacy. So good job. Uh, doing the uh, the advertisement there. Just a quick pause. If anyone has a question for Marnie, uh, please unmute yourself and let us know or stick it in the chat thread. Um, and, and Wendy, I also wanted yeah. to mention, if you go on our website, um, yeah. that we do, we used to do weekly calls on when, every Wednesday at 10 a.m. and they were all COVID related. And gosh, we could, we had enough to talk about that every week we had an hour with a great speaker or conversation about something. When COVID slowed down, we, we turned those to monthly. And our, so our, it's the first Wednesday of every month at 10 o'clock. You don't have to be a member. You don't even have to work for a nonprofit or be on a board. You can just come listen. And Melissa Houston is our speaker on Wednesday. So we are going to be hearing from the person who's really in the middle of all these applications and how it's going and how many applications and all that. I ran into her uh, your mayor was over today. We had our, our state of the city and our mayor had your mayor. So he's, they, he gave a nice shout out to GT, but I ran into Melissa today. So she is looking forward to talking to us. So if you want to get on, you do have to register for it, but they're free. And um, we have a different subject every month, but if you want oh, that's to from Melissa, it's, it's available. That's wonderful. Uh, we did the same thing. We went from a weekly call to a monthly call and uh, those are wrapping up. I'm not seeing any questions, Marnie. So I know you have another event to get to that uh, third shift that so many of us in the nonprofits work as we go um, and uh, keep our social capital sharp. And so hi, say hi to Melody for us. And uh, thank you for being here with us. We will send this recording out to everyone who's registered for our series. And thank you for the work right. you do. I'm very All right. Thank you, everybody. And again, call, you know, find me if you need me. We we are here to help. We don't. We wouldn't exist if the sector didn't exist. Is what I always say. And I think the sector will always exist because the problems will never go away. So thank you. I'll have a great evening. Good evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye.